So um, we're running slightly late, so I'll try and, I'll try and keep time. So I, I'm going to say uh, some broad things and, and try and relate this at least in part to the UK uh, perspective. And those of you who have heard me talk about the BETS project before will uh, realise that I'm a kind of, it was not expansive <coughs> enough, I'm in the non-expansive enough camp. Um, the question is, you know, did, did, we, did the OECD really go back and ask kind of fundamentally what's wrong uh, with the existing system, you know, and how can we think about changing it? Um, I think my, my second point there is, is very much, I agree with Richard that, you know, the OECD was very much focusing on tax avoidance by multinational companies. It wasn't, you know, addressing the kind of broader questions of, you know, of, of tax competition, what's wrong with the, with the international tax system generally. Um, I want to go back to kind of Grace's kind of definition of, of BEPS in the first place, I, if, I, if I got it right, was, you know, it's the difference between kind of where, where profit is really arising and where it's being taxed. Um, and, the, and the problem with that definition is that we have to figure out where profit is really arising. And that's, you know, that seems to me to be what the fundamental question is that we first need to address. Um, I think, you know, in, because we, the BEPS process didn't actually go and do that, I think, you know, the, the, you know, the results and the proposals that come out of it are, you know, they may well help in some instances in closing down loopholes, then they may raise more revenue for governments, but they're also going to introduce some new, you know, complexity um, and some arbitrariness in the, in the system. I, and I really, so what I thought I'd do here is just consider two examples, and this is, I'm an economist, I'm going to kind of have a slightly different style of presentation than the others. I want to actually go back to first principles and take you in, in 10 or 15 minutes through well, I think might be the first principles of how we should think about taxing interest and about risk in the context of transfer pricing. And in the context of that, I'll try and say something about in the UK's position. Um, so the action for interest, the main recommendations have has already been described, and I'm sure you know them already very well. So the, uh, the main idea is a fixed ratio rule, um, that, is, that the deduction for net interest should be limited to some proportion of EBITDA, you know, and the proposal it should be between 10 and 30 percent. Um, on top of that, there's an there's an optional uh, group ratio rule which says that the limit that limit of um, 10 to 30 percent could be higher if the group has greater external debt. So we look at that ratio of net interest to uh, EBITDA for the group as a whole, and if that's higher, then that could uh, extend that that rule. And there are there are kind of various other elements of the proposal. Uh, so de, de minimis threshold, some special treatment of public benefit projects, uh, carry forward of excess interest or unused capacity, and so on. So all of those things are, are, are in there. I, I think kind of one interesting thing to note is that you know, the proposal here are you know, they're quite different from the proposal, the approach used in hybrids. Now, when we're looking at the hybrids issue, the issue is you know, does, the, does this financial instrument get relief in one place and not be taxed in the other place? Um, so it's very much a question of, well, we might we might not give relief here depending on how it's being taxed somewhere else. Uh, and it seems to me that would, you know, one could think about applying that in this case as well, but that's not the direction in which the OECD went. Um, so what the perceived problems, if you read the OECD report, the, um, the, the kind of two element, two examples that the OECD gives of what the problem is with, uh, with interest. And the first is that uh, a parent company may borrow uh, and use that, in, uh, that money to kind of equity fund some foreign activity. Um, that foreign activity will not be taxed at home, but there may be an interest deduction for that. So that's, that's one issue. Um, the second issue is called the inbound side is just that subsidiary entities you know, may be heavily debt financed using excessive deductions on intergroup loans. And I've kind of put the excessive in red because I then searched in vain for what excessive might mean. Um, and I, I couldn't find anything. If anybody did find a definition of excessive, could you please let me know? But I couldn't find one. Um, so, you know, excessive is it's kind of like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder, I think, probably. Um, so that's, that's why I would like to go back to first principles and say, well, you know, can we actually think about what that might be? Uh, what do we mean by that? Um, and I think if we really go, want to go back to first principles and say, well, you know, why do we treat debt differently from equity in the first place? Um, so here's some characteristics of you know, a pure vanilla debt contract as opposed to a pure vanilla equity contract. You know, there's, the debt has a prior claim. Uh, you know, the return is determined in advance. It's, it's fixed unless the firm defaults, the borrower defaults. There's an issue of voting rights. Now, we can imagine, you know, a kind of whole continuum of different financial instruments which may 
have some of these properties and not others. Um, so my first question is, well, you know, do any of these properties give rise to us to think, you know, well, this is a good reason why we should treat this financial instrument different from this, this other financial instrument? And, um, you know, my answer to that is I can't think of any reason why, you know, these characteristics would want us to treat two different two financial instruments differently. Um, so that kind of says, well, we move on from there, say, well, you know, we have, we, you know, we've always done this, countries have, have always done this, so why is it? Um, so one possibility may be, well, we just treat the return to debt in a different place. So, you know, at a corporate level, we tax, you know, profits owned to the shareholders at the corporate level, but we may not tax them at the shareholder level. In the debt, we give relief at the corporate level, but perhaps we tax that at the level of the recipient. Um, well, I think it's two questions, two issues there. One is, you know, that's probably not true in general. Um, it's much more complicated than that. And the second is, well, why still, why would we want to do that anyway? Uh, it would be much easier if we just treated these two functions in the same way and tax it at the same level, and then we wouldn't have to distinguish between them. Um, so, I, you know, I start from the position, like I think every other academic economist that I know, I would say there's no real, you know, it's not a good starting point to treat these things differently. And because we do, we get into all of the kind of problems that the OECD identifies. Um, so uh, what, what would be principled alternatives? If we, if we were kind of thinking for, from first principles, I think we can go in two different directions. Um, the first is uh, an, an allowance for corporate equity, which is what Georgia mentioned um, in, in the question to David earlier. That would be to say, okay, we'll give relief for, for debt finance. We should give some equivalent relief for uh, equity finance. And the way we could do that is to try and measure the amount of equity which has been invested in the company. Uh, we have to measure some notional return on that, and we multiply one by the other, and that gives us something a measure of the opportunity cost of equity capital. Um, now, David said that's, that could all get very complicated, and you know maybe it could, but um, I, we... I'm not really going to go into the details of this here because we, you know, I just want to stick with the big picture for the moment. Um, but I would say, you know, it has actually been introduced or something along these lines has been introduced in other countries in, in Italy and Belgium, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, this was proposed long ago by the IFS Capital Taxes Group uh, in 1991. Um, on the other direction, we could go and say, well, we shouldn't give relief for interest at all. Um, and this was, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big... A report by the U.S. Treasury on this about the same time in the early 90s, um, and uh, you know that's going in the other direction. Both of these would would essentially kind of treat debt and equity finance in the same way, um, but they would do it in very different ways. You know, one would give relief for both, in which would effectively only tax profit over and above the required rate of return. The other would tax all profit and with no relief for the cost of finance. So, was the OECD doesn't address this? Um, the, you know, it says we should broadly continue as we are, except that we think there's some excessive treatment of debt. So we should treat debt more favorably, but not quite so favorable as it is at the moment. Um, we, I've mentioned the base erosion profit shifting thing. Um, I think there are other, you know, there are other questions. There, there are issues of kind of how we might have addressed this in different ways. You know, if we're worried about giving relief for, you know, borrowing that is not used for actual investment in this country, um, then we might think about how we could restrict relief for borrowing, which is then used for outbound investment. I think there are other quite big issues that we really need to think about here. I mean, um, and one is certainly double taxation. And the, the report which talks about the comprehensive business tax pointed out that, you know, if at the, at the moment, if a company earns some profit um, and it pays that out in interest to a bank, for example, you know, the, the, that income is not taxed at the level of the company, but it is taxed at the level of the bank. You know, it, if we give, if we no longer give relief at the level of the company, then it gets taxed at the level of the company. Well, then we have to think pretty hard about how we're going to tax banks, because uh, if we if we tax that interest when it's received in the bank as well, that's clearly a form of double taxation, and it's clearly much more general than that. If if we restrict interest relief in one country and it's paid to a recipient somewhere else that's taxed, then we get some form of double taxation. So I think you know we need to think about how that interest is being taxed in the hands of the recipient as well as what relief we're giving. I do worry about volatility in EBITDA. Profits go up and down um, you know, for a given amount of debt. If the company hits a shock, a negative shock, and its profits go down, then it may well get into trouble in terms of you know, what it can uh, offset in terms of its interest. Um, you know, some of the other proposals within the OECD report try and, try and address that. Um, 
So what about the UK? Well, as we as has already been discussed, the UK thinks that its existing treatment of interest is uh, rather advantageous and gives it a you know a, an advantage relative to other countries. Here's um, here's a quote, uh, two quotes from uh, different documents that the UK has produced. One from the Corporate Tax Roadmap, which said that the UK's current interest rules, which do not significantly restrict relief are considered by businesses as a competitive advantage, and that seemed to be a good thing back in 2010. Um, a bit more recently, uh, in the UK, interest expense for share acquisitions is available, which also helps promote the UK as a holding company, as a holding company location. So the, you know, the UK government has you know, actively kind of used its treatment as interest as a competitive advantage. Um, so what should the UK do now? Um, should it introduce the UK recommendations? I, it seems to me there really is a conflict here. You know, we could, you know, we could imp introduce the UK recommendations, but we're going to weaken our competitive position, and we have to make a decision as to which we're going to do. Um, suppose we do, um, and there are all kinds of issues about exactly how it's implemented. Um, but then I, I would like to raise the question of what, we, what should we do with the money? We're going to raise some more money here because we're restricting interest deductibility, and we could do at least three things with it. Uh, one would be to just pay off the deficit. Another would be to reduce the corporation tax rate even further. Um, and another would be to introduce a kind of partial ACE, a partial allowance for corporate equity. Um, so I won't go into detail in this, but the idea would be to say, you know, if we're restricting interest deductibility, we're, we're, we're giving now partial relief for the cost of debt finance. We could use the money that we save to give partial relief for the cost of equity finance um, and try and you know, align um, the relief that we give for debt and equity finance in a, in a way which actually would meet some kind of more or less go back to first principles and say this was a good idea. So I, you know, I think if the UK government is going to do this, um, I would advocate that it actually should say, okay, we're going to use this money to introduce a partial ACE and try and equalise the cost of debt and equity. Um, let me let me move on uh, to transfer pricing and risk. Um, again, we've already discussed this at, at, at some length, so I won't go into details about exactly what the OECD has proposed. Um, I, th I think what I'd like to do is actually go back and kind of ask, you know, under the existing system and under the proposed system, what would be the what would be the outcomes and where is risk? So I really want to ask some basic first principles. So here we have a, a picture of a shareholder and a company. The shareholder owns shares in the company. They could be in the same country or different companies. This is a risky investment. The shareholder says, this is a risky investment. I want a higher rate of return on my investment. That means that the company C has to earn a higher rate of return. OK, that's fine. That's the general principle. Now, let's suppose it make it a little bit more complicated and say the shareholder now in shares in the company, which is now a parent company, and the parent company has two affiliates or two subsidiaries in different countries, but they're all part of the same business. It's exactly the same business as it was before. You know, A1 A and A2 are subsidiaries which are you know, they're doing different parts. One may be doing marketing or finance or production, but these are not separate businesses. Um, now I'd like to ask the question, you know, where's risk borne now? Uh, well, it's certainly borne by the shareholder. The shareholder will want a higher rate of return, you know, from, its, from, its in, from his investment in P, for example. Can we really say anything about, you know, wh what the shareholder would like a higher rate of return in A1 or A2? Um, Seems to me the answer is that no, not really. Um, there is no particular risk in A1 or A2. There's a risk for the for the company as a whole, uh, which is reflected in the required return by the shareholder. Um, but there's no real way of allocating risk between A1 and A2. Um, and this is, you know, this is effectively what the OECD points out. You know, if A2 is in a tax haven, it's relatively easy for companies to put their their risk there, earn a high rate of return there, and you know. Obviously, he makes a good point. It seems to me that that's not a very good way of proceeding. Um, but I make a prior point to that. We say, well, it doesn't really make all that much sense in the first place to ask whether risk is in A1 or A2. Risk is borne by the shareholder. might be in P, but it's not really in either of those two places, it seems to me. So the solution is to say, well, we're, we're not going to just look at those contractual relationships. We're going to look where uh, you know, this risk is controlled. Well, let's suppose that you know, we take away A2 and put a controller of risk in there. Um, in which case, now what we're going to do is you know, basically allocate you know, higher profits to place C where the controller is because there's some real activity taking place there. Um, so is that 
really good proxy for the location of risk? I think my first answer to that is not really, because you know I didn't think risk was in either of these places in the, to start off with, and I still don't think it's in C or A1 really. Um, then the second question is, you know, actually is looking at where the controller of risk is, is that a good proxy for expecting a higher rate of return in that activity? Now, actually, it seems to me, if you think about it, it goes the other direction. You know, I suppose I've got a really good controller of risk. I pay him a lot of money, and he manages to reduce risk in my activity. What does that do? Well, I have a big fee because I have to pay him a, a hefty salary, but actually it reduces risk, and the shareholders are very happy. I now, the shareholders now demand a lower rate of return on, on, its act, on their activity, on their investment. Um, so what, the, what this, this good control of risk has done is to reduce risk and therefore you know, reduce the expected profit in this activity, and if anything, is reduced the expected profit in C. Um, so it seems, if anything, you know, where the controller, a, a good control of risk you know, earning high profits for the firm, in a sense, that's actually negatively correlated with risk. So I'm not entirely persuaded by this either. Um, and I think, you know, if we ask more generally, is, is C really a proxy for economic substance and value creation? Well, there I kind of worry, actually, suppose, suppose there's an asset created in P. There's research and development done, and that was all done in P. And actually, the returns that this company is earning is, is a return to that research and development. It's not really a return to, you know, where that risk is now managed and, you know, where the royalty comes into so I kind of I would worry about that as well, was whether it really, really identifying uh, economic substance in this case. Um, so it seems to me what you know what we're actually doing here is saying it seems to me you know we start off from a position where we're trying to identify what risk is, and that seems to be somewhat questionable. We then replace that and say we're not doing that terribly well, so we're going to replace that with you know where the controller is because that's a good proxy for risk. That seems to me to be questionable as well. But where we end up with is, is actually something much more like a formula of apportionment. We're saying, OK, we don't really know where we can tax this, this income. Um, you know, the proxy we're going to use is where your key personnel are, you know, the, in this case, the control of risk. Um, now, that may or may not be a good way forward, and possibly is a good way forward. But it, it would seem to me to be easier if we kind of went straight there rather than kind of try to figure this out in the, in the context of uh, where risk is. And I will stop there. Thanks.